I'm Ann Dart. I'm Tracy Stormy. And I'm Kathy Knight. And together we are It Was a Dark and Stormy Book Club, a podcast for mystery lovers. Welcome. If you enjoy our show, please consider contributing to the Dark and Stormy Patreon. By becoming a patron, you will help us create better and quality content. There are also benefits to becoming a patron, such as exclusive content and Dark and Stormy merchandise. Become a supporter at patreon.com slash darkandstormybc. Check our website for the link. We appreciate any and all contributions. Thank you. (laughs) Well, welcome to the show. We have a jam-packed episode. We have two... Two. Two interviews. Yeah, two for the price of one. We are going to have Makita Brotman, who is a true crime author. But first, we are going to have Bess Carnan. Bess Carnan was this year's Malice Domestic Grand winner for the William F. Deke Malice Domestic Grants Program for Unpublished Writers. Bess had to be pushed out the door to go away to college, but immediately developed wanderlust. These days, she and her husband live in Orlando, Florida with their rescued garbage cat Squeaker and an endless stream of foster kittens. In between feedings, flea baths, and snuggles, she writes cozy mysteries that are really love letters to all the places she's lived. We would like to welcome Bess Carnan. Welcome, Bess. Hello. I'm happy to be here. Bess, how did you get started writing and what drew you to the mystery genre? Oh, goodness. I think probably I started pretty much where everyone did, reading a lot of Nancy Drew and Hardy Boys when I was young. But it was also, I think, almost fate. Because in elementary school, my third grade teacher had us all write a story, and mine was The Mystery of the Missing Ruby Ring. Mm. So when I quit grad school, the first thing I wrote was an urban fantasy, which lends itself really well to mysteries. It has that structure, you know, guaranteeing your starting point. Someone dies and someone has to find who done it. I eventually had to trunk the urban fantasy, but I kept the mystery. Can you tell us the process for the William F. D. Grant Dramalis? Well, it's a lot of very nervous waiting. Applications are due on November 1st. It's open now in case anyone wants to apply. You send in three chapters and a synopsis, and then you spend about three months jumping nervously every time you get an email notification. In February, I got a phone call from a number that I didn't know, very uncharacteristically of myself. I picked it up, and it was Harriet Sackler of the Committee for the Grant. I remember almost nothing that she said. Luckily, she's very patient, emailed it all to me afterward. And then it's three more months of waiting where you can't tell anyone. And then at Malice, you get to meet the committee and you make a speech at the Agatha Award Banquet. Yes, we were there for your speech. And of course, we were anxious to meet you. Can you give us a description of your proposed book and what type of book will it be? Sure. It's a cozy mystery. So there's no like gore or blood. It's just sort of fun. It follows a travel blogger and her friend during their stay on the big island of Hawaii, and her friend is accused of murder. So it becomes sort of a race against time for them to find out who actually killed the other person, because her friend's husband is about to join them in a week for their anniversary. Nothing is scarier than upsetting your spouse on an important day. That's an interesting concept, a travel blogger. I don't think I've heard that one yet. Yeah, I actually sort of got the idea. There's a series by Colette London called The Chocolate Whisperer, and it's chocolate-themed, but she travels around the world doing her chocolate magic. Is this an excuse for you to travel around the world now? You know, actually, they're set places that I've either lived in or been to. So it's sort of me sharing my love of those places. But yes, future books, I already have been asking my husband, hey, how do you feel about going to Tel Aviv? Maybe we should go to South Africa for a while, helping plan future vacations. That's always fun. And a (laughs) (laughs) write-off. Exactly. Well, Bess, what will your generation bring to the mystery genre? Well, hopefully an increase in readership. Also, ideally, I think a new range of perspectives. YA, I think, is of all the genres doing the best job of being more diverse, having a wider range of authors from different backgrounds. As millennials and Gen Z grow up, we're bringing that being accustomed to reading from more varied perspectives with us. And we want that in our adult reading material as well. And I think that the one thing that your generation will have that older generations have is more technology, just being more hip to technology. Maybe more open to the different 
accesses to reading. Definitely. It's a mixed blessing because on the one hand, we have audiobooks, we have ebooks, we have all kinds of ways to access the new reading materials, which makes it more possible for new voices to break in. But it also means that as writers, there's a lot more for us to keep up with. That is very true. And I think one of the challenges of having a lot of technology is the way a detective in a book will detect is so much different than, say, a historical novel. True. If the average amateur sleuth can't access fingerprints, we have Google or Facebook. If you have private eye like Kinsey Malone or Stephanie Plum, they can access all of those programs that get you more detailed information as well. In a way, it's almost easier for amateur sleuths today than it was for detectives 100 years ago. What is your writing kryptonite? Can I say all of it? Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. I said no. You said yes. <laughs> I think probably the hardest part is just getting started every day. The biggest flaw in picking writing as a career or like the thing that your passion project is that it doesn't have a lot of instant gratification. You sit down, you write 500 words, but you have to wait months before you get to editing, before you have a completed project. Last year, I discovered something called procrastibaking, which is baking to avoid your actual work. And I actually ended up starting a sourdough starter, which is perfect for procrastination because then you have to bake with it every week and you have to feed it and keep it alive. It gives you a whole lot of things you can do to avoid actual work. I think that's peak dedication to avoiding your craft. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> well, we interviewed Hannah Dennison, and she said that she dreads the whole process, but she loves having written. And I thought that was interesting. Yeah, I think I forget who the quote is attributed to, but there is a quote. I hate writing. I love having written. That was Dorothy Parker. Yes. yes. And that's yes. who she was quoting. Absolutely. Yes. It's how I feel about cleaning my house. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I have a quarantine room full of six foster kittens. I'm currently procrastinating on that as well. Oh, (laughs) Jay. Are there parts of your work in progress that anyone who knows you will say that is so vast? Probably the first thing would be just my passion for my locations. I always say that if I ever settle down, it'll be in Hawaii. But I think I say that everywhere. And my protagonist, Jax, also says it. In every book, she's like, you know, I could just stop traveling and live here. Probably the second thing is I have little geeky asides, like referencing D&D or talking about life on the internet, which are just so much a part of my everyday life that I think will be instantly recognizable to people who know me. What authors inspired you? Kelly Garrett, for sure. She writes the Detected by Day series. Yes. Yes. I was thinking about how to describe it, and it's Janet Ivanovich's Stephanie Plum series, but on the West Coast. You have the funny characters, you get really invested in her protagonist, gives you a peek into a lifestyle that not everyone experiences. Like for Stephanie Plum, it's life in the Berg and that sort of sort of suburban New Jersey setting. For Detective by Day, it's insider LA. You get to see what it's like on the red carpet and in green rooms. And I really hope that I can write books that make people smile like hers do in person because I met her at BoucherCon last year. She's so smart and like really generous with her time to the writing community. So I hope that when I grew up, I'm, I'm a lot like her. Well, I know she does a lot of work for Sisters in Crime. She really does. She also is, I think, the co-founder of Crime Writers of Color. Yeah, she's helping me with the Queer Crime Writers Project that I'm a part of. Hmm. And oh, at well. no point is she like, you ask too many questions, just stop. She always says, yes, come to me with whatever. Oh, that's okay. great. Especially for aspiring authors. They need that. I don't know how she has time for it all or for herself. What do you hope to inspire in your future readers? I'm hoping that they develop a passion for the settings. Because they're places I've been and they're places that I love, I want them to be inspired to go there to explore or to at least feel like they've had a bit of a taste of it to make the world more colorful. That's wonderful. I Uh, like that. That's a great answer. I I think that's great. We know you have a work in progress. Do we have a timeline for that? And do you have any upcoming event that you'd like to let our listeners know about? Well, I'll be at BoucherCon's 50th in Texas this fall. So I hope people come and say hi there. As for the book, it's out on submission to publishing houses right now. So fingers crossed, you'll see my name in, you know, Publishers Marketplace or something in the not too distant future. But until then, people can keep up with me at my website, which is bestcardinbooks.com. Right. We will definitely update our show notes with that information and definitely keep us posted of when your book does come out because we'd love to give it a shout out on the show. Oh, thank you so much. Believe me, the whole world will know. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we follow you on all your social media, so we will definitely be keeping an eye on that. Oh, thank you so much.
Now, that wasn't so bad, was it? Ooh, no, I even remembered to breathe through parts of it. <laughs> Very good. I have a question for you. How did you get started as a foster mother for kittens? My husband and I have sort of been fostering off and on kind of by accident for several years. You know, people will bring an animal and be like, I found it. What do I do? But last year, our maintenance at our apartment building called and they were like, we found a kitten in the dumpster and you talk about cats all the time. What do we do with it? I took him to the vet. And we had to spend three days giving him hourly round-the-clock care before he stopped trying to die on us. Aww. And I was like, this is way above my knowledge. So I got in touch with the local shelter. And we ended up keeping him. He's sitting at my feet right now, looking terribly bored and uninterested. <laughs> <laughs> As they do. Yeah, there's nothing like a cat for keeping your ego in check. <laughs> yes. But we hooked into their foster program. So I've been fostering with Orange County Animal Services for a year now. Oh, that's great. That is great. So here's a question. Will there be a cat in your book? Not in these. I thought about it because there are adventure cats that travel around the world with their people. I felt like it was adding one too many things that I couldn't control. <laughs> <laughs> and that might be an oversaturated theme, too. <laughs> well, she could mention a cat. Well, you can mention a cat, I suppose. Yes. There's actually an organization for people that write about cats. Oh, really? Yeah, Is there fact, really? Yeah, it's... fact fiction, how-to, everything. It's it's a full organization just for cat writers. Oh, oh wow. my goodness. We have to share that with our friend Roland. <laughs> <laughs> but not for a good reason. Yeah, he hates books. pets. Yeah, he doesn't like to read about pets, especially if they think and talk in the books. Yes. He's a, not a fan. Every chance we get, we, we torture him. We, yeah. <laughs> I do have thoughts about another series about a cat foster, because I think that that would be a really That'd interesting a good idea. And if you're doing TNR, you know, trap, neuter, return, that puts you in all kinds of strange places in the dark of the night. You can trip over all kinds of dead bodies. That would be a great book. There you go. Uh, I think so. That's a, I think that's unique. I'm, yeah. I haven't heard anything The crazy like cat lady goes and finds bodies. I think that would work really great. I think so, too. But I have ADHD, so I have to focus really hard on one thing at a time. So uh, I, homicide I, I identify with that. <laughs> Beth, it was very nice talking to you today, <laughs> and we wish you all the best. Keep us posted on your book. We'll be looking for that to be published. Yes, we will. Any minute now. Thank you so much. This was really cool. I really appreciate being on. Thank you for taking the time. Oh, thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Y'all have a good one. Nikita Brotman, Ph.D., is a psychoanalyst and nonfiction writer whose work includes elements of true crime, memoir, history, and forensic psychology. She is a professor in the Department of Humanistic Studies at the Maryland Institute College of Art in Baltimore. We would like to welcome Makita Brotman to the show. She wrote the fascinating book, An Unexplained Death. Welcome, Makita. Thanks for having me. Well, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you came to investigate the death of Ray Rivera? I'm originally British. I've been living in the U.S. for the last about 20 years. I live in Baltimore and I teach at MICA, which is the Maryland Institute College of Art. And when I came to Baltimore, my partner and I bought this big, beautiful apartment in a building called the Belvedere, which used to be the old Belvedere Hotel in Baltimore. It's a very famous landmark built around the turn of the century. Since then, it's been made into condominiums. It was a hotel for a long time. I really loved living there. It was a really beautiful place. I've always been interested, like you, I'm sure, in true crime, in unexplained mysteries, and I've always been a fan of true crime shows and documentaries and especially books, especially those where the true crime is like a springboard to investigate other things, because I've often felt that crime is really just a entry point into the other really interesting parts of the human experience. We'd only been living there a year when I went out one morning to walk my dog early in the morning and I saw these missing posters everywhere, which hadn't been there the night before. I was curious about them because the man who was missing was remarkably conspicuous, which isn't always the case on missing posters. He was six foot four, I think, or five, young, handsome, newlywed, and it struck me as just strange that someone who's so conspicuous could have gone missing. Then, just over a week later, his body was found in the Belvedere Hotel, where I live. He appeared to have jumped from the roof and crashed through the roof of an annex, which is about two floors high. 
and landed in an office which was disused. And so, for that reason, nobody had found the body for over a week. Obviously, it was something that happened so close to me, and it was such a compelling story. I mean, there were so many strange things about it that it seemed as though this mystery had just landed right in my lap, and I couldn't help wanting to investigate. And it wasn't right away that I decided to write a book about it. That was a little bit further into the investigation. And 